Hey, Fellowship Bible Church. I am very excited to be able to share God's Word with you today and, and excited to be able to resume our series in the book of Romans. Uh, I think you're going to find that uh, where God has us in Romans is going to be very helpful for us today because what we're going to, what we're going to see, even though the concepts that we're going to encounter are very, very basic to us, we, we will have known them for a long, long time. You're going to see that in coming back and revisiting some of these basic concepts, it's going to broaden our picture of who God is and I think give us a, a better understanding of why we can trust him in, uh, in, in the situation that we're in. And I don't know about you guys, but I hit a point this past week where I just was at emotional overload. In fact, I can give you the time. For me, it was at 930 at night on Wednesday night, and I'd spent a lot of time talking to people who are in distress for just a number of different reasons, whether it had to do with the job or trying to keep people employed when the business wasn't bringing in revenue or trying to homeschool kids when uh, they're also working and just uh, just real challenges and emotional distress. And by about 9.30 Wednesday night, I just was, um, I was overloaded. And I, I came back to that truth that uh, I've, I've talked about before in other contexts, and that is when we're in moments like this, what we need is a fresh vision of who God is. And that's because we live every single moment at kind of this crossroads, at this interesting juncture. We live every single moment at this point where, where we're looking ahead at our future and we're trying to decide, is what God, is what God has for us, is it for our good is or, or is it for our destruction? And if we believe that it's for our good, we respond in faith. If we believe that it's for our destruction, then we respond in some form of a um, self-focused and probably inappropriately self-protective self manner. But situations like we're in today really bring out that we live at this type of a juncture. And in living in that type of a juncture, what we need if we're going to respond in faith is a big vision of who God is. And you see, here's the bottom line question that we have to face. On what basis do you trust God? Now, if you think about it, that question really has two parts of it, parts to it. One of it is, uh, what, what is the evidence? What's the foundation? What do we look at to say that God is trustworthy? And the other part of it is, well, what's the basis for my relationship with God that, that I get to participate in that trustworthiness? You see, one of it is about God. What has he done to demonstrate that he is worthy of my trust? And the other question is, is really more about myself. What have I done? And both versions of those questions are, are really important. You see, underneath our distress is this, is, is this lurking sense of how do I know that God can be trusted with my finances, with my health, with my loved ones, when the stakes are as high as they can get? And how do I know that I've done my part to benefit from God's trustworthiness? In today's passage, Romans chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 21 and go to verse 31. Today's passage is going to absolutely grab your heart because it is going to bring out the basis of our trusting God, and it is going to drive home the point that God is unswervingly on your side. Now, for us to really get that, we need to go back and we need to kind of uh, take a you are here picture of where we are in the book of Romans. Um, we need to kind of reassess or reevaluate what has Paul been doing and how, where are we picking up the story? Now, remember, as we've said each week, that the book of Romans is really divided into two parts. The first part shows that God gives righteousness. And the second part shows how the righteous live in response to that. Now, before we had our coronavirus-sponsored break, we had just completed this first section of the first part the need for righteousness. And to kind of help us reset what Paul has said there, and maybe even look at the same thing from a different angle, 
I wanted to suggest a thought experiment, and I actually did this online during the week. I hope you saw it and hope you had a chance to think about it some, but if not, that's fine. And here, here's the thought experiment. What is perfect and complete justice? Or another way of asking that same question, what does perfect justice look like for a completely righteous, all-powerful, all-knowing, totally wise God? Now, if you want to, you can respond to that as you're chatting through the sermon, and if that'll help keep you awake, that'll be great. Um, but as I've been reflecting on that question, here's how I would answer it. Perfect justice means that every single wrong is answered for. It's, it's bringing to account and setting right everything that, has, that is wrong in the universe and to do it in a way that is appropriate for the wrong that was done. So for it to be perfect justice, we're talking about every single wrong. We're talking about every act of treason and every deceitful word that's spoken, but we're also talking about every hurtful thought that we have. Now, we say that, and that's where we start backpedaling, right? Because we, we want to justify ourselves a little bit. And we, we start saying, well, what's the appropriate response to a hurtful thought? Because, I mean, no one's actually hurt by it. Well, look at it this way. And this is an important principle that, that's going to carry through. What you have done in that thought is you have demeaned someone within yourself whom God loves infinitely. And I think that's probably a pretty big deal to God. So if you think about perfect justice, it means that every word or action or thought or every failure to act or every failure to speak when we should have that results in the, deme the, the diminishing or demeaning of God himself or the demeaning of the people or creation that he loves must be answered for. And because we're talking about demeaning God, there's no such thing as just a little wrong. So you see, if you ever come face to face with perfect justice of a holy God, it is absolutely going to undo you. And it's not just your fear that God's justice will destroy you, although that's going to be there. It's the realization that God's justice can destroy you, and it should. If you come face to face with perfect justice, you will be in despair, and you will own responsibility for it. And that is exactly where Paul has taken us up to this point in the book of Romans. Every single person, regardless of how religious, regardless of their cultural background, regardless of all the good deeds that they've done, every single person is accountable to the perfect justice of God, and no one is even close to being able to stand in the face of that perfect justice. There is nothing you can do about it, and there are no excuses that you can make. All you can do in the face of perfect justice is say, I am guilty and plead for mercy. Now, if you don't understand and if you don't take ownership of the desperate situation that Paul has painted up to this point in the book of Romans, you are not going to understand what comes next. And you will actually continue to wrestle with whether you can trust God. And here's why. You're going to continue to question the basis for trusting God. You will question if the evidence is strong enough that God is trustworthy, or you're going to question if you have done your part. But here's where Paul's going. Paul is going to say that everything that he has said about the desperate nature of our situation, everything that's led up to this passage, this point in Romans, that was then. And then look at the two words he's going to use to start verse 21. But now, but now things have changed. And Paul sets out that change in two paragraphs. The two paragraphs give us the basis for trusting God that we need. The first paragraph 
shows that perfect justice and perfect mercy intersect on the cross. And that is the evidence that we need to trust God. And the second paragraph shows that faith is the only criteria we need to know, that we need to meet to know that God is on our side. So let's start by looking at the first paragraph, which is the intersection of justice and mercy. And that first paragraph takes us from Romans 3.21 to Romans 3.26. But now, the major shift in Romans, but now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I've been trying to think through how to unpack and bring alive this paragraph a little bit because there is so much that is in here. This is just a really, really dense paragraph. And the best way I could think of to, to really cut through and bring out what this paragraph was saying was to focus on this little word that is right in the middle of the paragraph. And it's this word propitiation. It's not a word that we normally use. The technical definition of propitiation is, is a satisfaction of wrath. Now, although that's the technical definition, for the original readers and listeners of this passage, they would have thought of something very specific. A picture would have come to mind. And that picture was a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark was the original container of the Ten Commandments, and it was the central symbol of God's presence with the people of Israel. And what's interesting is when the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek, which they would have had at the time that Paul wrote this, the word that was used to translate um, the mercy seat, a part of this a part of this covenant, Ark of the Covenant, was the word that we have translated propitiation. It's the same word. So what's the mercy seat? Well, you'll see that there's a top to this ark. It's about 45 inches long here and about 27 inches here. It's made out of pure gold. There are two cherubim that sit on the top of that. <clears throat> Those cherubim in this top part represents the throne room of God, and it's God sitting on his throne over, looking out over his people. Now, once a year, it's called the Day of Atonement, a priest would sacrifice a lamb and sprinkle the blood of that lamb on this mercy seat. And that was done as a way of pleading for forgiveness for the sins of the nation. And when the blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the mercy seat, God's people trusted that they were forgiven and protected from the wrath of God. And that is the very word that Paul uses to describe Jesus. He is the mercy seat. He is the propitiation. So what Paul is saying is that Jesus is our mercy seat. He is our propitiation. Jesus' death is the complete satisfaction of God's wrath. And we receive that benefit by faith. Now let's work backwards. Because God's wrath was satisfied by Jesus' death, we are redeemed. This word redeemed was a word that was used for the payment for the release of a slave. And, and so what Paul is saying here is we are released from the then of chapters one and three, and that was accomplished by Jesus' death. We couldn't be set free from the then of chapters one and three if we weren't made right with God. That's what this word means. We were made right with God by his grace. It's a free gift. And some of your translations actually translate that as some form of free and the idea is that it is something that God brings to us and gives to us. It is not based on our efforts. 
You see, God sees our dire situation that Paul has laid out in the first chapters of one through three. God sees the then and he meets it with his mercy, the mercy seat of Christ. Some of you may um, know the musical Les Mis. It's actually a book before a musical. It's a, it's a really wonderful story, very well known. Um, and the story features a particular man by the name of Jean. And Jean has been guilty. He's actually just been released from prison when the story picks up. Uh, and he is goes almost immediately back into his old ways. He steals something extremely valuable from someone. But that person, when Jean is caught, that victim of the crime, instead of punishing Jean, extends mercy to him, extends an unexpected, extraordinary mercy to Jean. And Jean is able to go forward and his life is changed because of that mercy. But here's the problem. There's someone else in this story too. There's a policeman. And this policeman is extremely committed to justice. And the tension of the story centers on, the, on Jean, who has received mercy, but must live looking over his shoulder at this policeman who continues to come after him. And Jean lives looking over his shoulder, wondering when justice will catch him. And for many of us, that is how we think about the mercy of God. It was fantastic in the moment that it set us free. But we live afraid, looking over our shoulder, that God's justice is still after us and it's going to catch us. We think that God's mercy, it's, it's like a wall that he dropped in between us and his justice. But God's justice is still coming after us. God's justice still wants to get at us. But mercy stands in its way. And then the thinking is, the fear is, every time we blow it, every time we sin, we fear that we are taking away a brick, a piece of that wall. And eventually, God's justice comes after us and, and punishes us. Now, if you don't think that that's really the case, just think about the evidence you see of that in churches that you've grown up with or in churches today. And I'll just share some examples that I've heard plenty of times in churches. You'll hear things like, to someone who is struggling financially, are you giving to the church? Because I found that people who give to the church don't struggle financially. You'll find that someone say, says to a person who's sick, do you have sin in your life that you need to confess and repent of? You'll find to, that someone who's having a bad day, a person will say to them, well, did you do your devotions this morning? And you see the assumptions behind all of those statements is that bad things happen because God is punishing you. God's justice has broken through the wall of mercy and has finally gotten to you. And if that is your thinking, in days like days that we live in today, then what you are going to think about what is happening in our world and in your life is that your worst fears about God have come true and that his mercy was just a temporary, it was, it was just a barrier that his justice would eventually break through. And you see, that's where the last part of this paragraph becomes so incredibly important in understanding the character of God and understanding the vision that we need to have for who God is. In the last paragraph, what he does is he looks back a little bit and he says that in God's forbearance, he in the past, he had passed over former sins. He's, he's talking about the sins that had committed be, that were committed before the cross. And you see, the reality is that when the sacrifice was made on the day of atonement and the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, that was not enough to satisfy the demands of perfect justice. It was not enough to remove the guilt. It was only a pointer to what was going to come and actually remove the guilt. But it was enough for God to say, I will, I, I will look over them. I will in my forbearance pass over those sins until the day comes where the perfect sacrifice is given that does demand, that does fulfill all the demands of guilt 
and all the demands of perfect justice. And that, of course, came on the cross. And you see, this is how God can be both just to meet all the requirements of perfect justice, to deal with every, even the smallest wrong that must be dealt with in all of the cosmos. And he can be the justifier at the same time. He can be merciful and declare us right with God. You see, when there was no other reasonable outcome but your condemnation, God said, I am going to be just and every single wrong in your life is going to be answered for. And then here's how he did that. He put Jesus on the cross and he declared that Jesus has paid the price for everything that you have done. And you are declared justified, right with God. Justice has been satisfied. There is nothing left to pay for ever the police officer chasing Jean and Les Mis has gone home and he's content. He's not out looking anymore. So the picture of, of what actually happens is much closer to this. And this is why we can trust God. This is the evidence. It's the cross. You see, when justice, when Christ died, justice was moved from here. It's not something that was pursuing us. It was united with his mercy on the cross. And Everything was completely paid for. When the only logical response to you was condemnation and rejection, God once and for all met every single demand of justice with mercy. And he did it in such a way that you never, ever have to look over your shoulder. There is nothing left for you to pay for. And if God loves you that much, when you were condemned and would have condemned yourself in the face of perfect justice, do you see that he is trustworthy today when you stand now before him justified right with him? On what basis do you trust God? What's the evidence? The evidence is the cross. That's what you have to look at and say, this is why I know I can trust God because when there is nothing in me that should have been anything other than condemned, God took his perfect justice and perfect mercy and he intersected them at the cross so that I never have to look over my shoulder again. So then the second question remains, how do we access that relationship? And of course, this again is not going to be anything new to you if you've grown up in church. You access it by faith. And that is what Paul is driving home again in this, in this uh, second paragraph. The, really the issue is, what is the basis of access? Is it, is it the fact that I participate in a certain group? That's what the Jews had thought. Or is it something else? And this is it's not the basis of, of participating in a group or fulfilling the rules. It is by faith. And it's interesting how he lays this out. As I read this, catch that he uses a series of questions. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of a law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by, his, by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Now, Paul could have made his points in probably just one or two short sentences, but he doesn't do that. He chooses to use a series of questions to slow us down, to make sure that we just don't go rushing past this and take it for granted. So let's slow down a bit and just work ourselves through these questions. What then becomes of our boasting? Well, who's he talking to here? He's talking to the Jews that were in that Roman church. The Jews that were in the church considered themselves having a reason to boast. They were a part of God's special people. They had the law. They, they, they had all of the different commandments and, and the covenant with God that, that kept them in that special relationship. And that for them was a reason of boasting. And Paul is saying, look, all those things are excluded. 
Why? Because of the law of Moses, the law of works, the law of obeying the rules? No. But by the law of faith. Now, what in the world is the law of faith? Well, it's everything that he was just talking about in that first paragraph that we just looked at. And he summarizes that in verse 28. It's that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now, if you grew up in church, you heard this sort of thing a lot, and we throw it out a lot. So what does it actually mean? Well, the word faith that's translated here is a word that means to have confidence to the point of a positive response. That positive response isn't necessarily an action. In fact, especially right away at the first, it's not. It's more of an internal uh, response. It's an internal acknowledgement of everything that we said in, chat, or in, in paragraph one of being true. It, it's that internal response that says that I am absolutely guilty before perfect justice, and there are no excuses, and there is nothing I can do about it. But I also acknowledge, and I have confidence in, that Jesus is exactly who he said he was and exactly who Paul said he was in that first paragraph, that he is the propitiation, the mercy seat, that by his death on the cross, the wrath of God is completely satisfied. His justice has been joined to mercy on the cross, and I don't have to look over my shoulder anymore. And the result of that is that he has taken the full penalty for every aspect of my life that demands justice. And I am declared just before God. See, the response of faith says all of that is true. And that is what I want in my life. Now, Paul continues the questions. And basically, the next set of questions is, how far does God's reign extend? Is God the God of Jews only? You see, if they were thinking that that that. The relationship with God was based on being a part of the certain group or following a certain set of rules, then it would seem to limit the the extent of God's reign. But he said, no, he's not the God of the Jews only. He's a God of absolutely everyone. And so the rule of faith, the law of faith applies to absolutely everyone. It's not limited to if you're part of a certain ethnic group or a certain background, if you grew up in the church or didn't grow up in the church, it's it's available to everyone. And then he raises the question, the last question, do we then overthrow the law of God by this faith? What, what's he saying there? Is he's, he's asking the question, does faith just kind of do away with the law and the law has no value anymore? And he's going to get into this more later in the book, but, but ultimately he's saying, look, the rules have a place in your life, but that place is upheld by faith. We uphold the law through faith. Now, just a quick side note here. We tend to get that exactly backwards. We tend to think that rule keeping is what keeps our faith going and that it what it's what keeps our relationship with God going. But as you're going to see as we go through the book of Romans, it is exactly the opposite. And we actually saw this when we looked at Ephesians. Our obedience comes out of our faith. Our obedience is the result of God having pursued us and God entering into relationship with us. It's not the other way around, but we tend to get that confused all the time. And when we are getting that confused, what we tend to do is we go back to that first picture of God's justice trying to break through the wall of mercy. And we think that somehow it's up to us to keep that wall of mercy standing. See, Paul's point in this paragraph is, again, it's not news to us if, if we grew up if we grew up in the church, but this is where we got it from, is from this passage. Paul's point is that if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you never need to question that God is on your side, ever. You never need to look over your shoulder wondering if God's justice is going to catch up with you in the form of a coronavirus or the form of a lost job or the form of, of stress in your life of, of, because you're homeschooling your kids. That's not how the character of God's work, of God works. And just as we received justification by faith, we continue to live in relationship with God by faith by looking at the cross and saying, there 
the perfect mercy and the perfect of, the perfect justice of God intersected for my good and his glory. So what does this mean to us right now? Are you stressed about finances? Well, that's totally understandable. But you see, the issue is not, as so many of us are trying to make it, trying to get God happy with you by doing the right thing so he'll fix your finances or protect your job. The issue is, how is God going to use this financial loss in this situation as you respond in faith to him? What does it mean to respond in faith? It means acknowledging to the Lord that you don't know how you're going to get through this situation, how you're going to meet all all of your obligations, but telling him that you know he will care for you no matter what happens. It also means not allowing pride to keep you from asking for the help that, that the Lord is making available to you through other people around you, through this body. It means saying to the Lord that you trust that he is going to use this situation to make you more like Christ and that you are ready to participate in that process. And when that happens, the Lord is is going to work in your life in a way that may be very unexpected. It may involve taking things from your life that you thought were necessary for your identity and for for your security. But when they are gone, you are going to discover that the Lord is good. Are you worried about illness? That's understandable. But you see, the issue is not trying to get God on your side so that you'll be healed or protected from illness. God is on your side. The issue is how God will use this illness as you respond to him in faith. It's the same process as with finances. Honestly, go before the Lord. Tell him we are concerned. Be willing to be changed by him. Be confident that on the other side, you will see that God was good to you all along. And the same is true with other anxiety or confusion that we're facing. The promise is not that God is going to give you detailed answers if you spend enough time in prayer or Bible study, although it's incredibly important that you spend time in prayer and Bible study. The promise is that God is going to care for your soul as you move forward in faith. Same process, honesty with the Lord, willingness to be changed by him, confidence that on the other side, you will see that God was good to you all along. Here is the picture that Paul is giving us in these verses. It is a picture that we can trust God's unfailing righteousness and justice and his unfailing mercy that is revealed on the cross. As most of you know, I went through this last week not knowing if I had the coronavirus. And I needed to know that I could trust God. And I needed to keep coming back to the cross. If that is how much God loves me, when I deserved to be condemned, then I can know that I trust him now. I had to keep reminding myself that all God asks for me is to respond to him in faith. Faith to enter into relationship with him and faith in response to him in the middle of the mess that we are in. I want to wrap up by just suggesting a few ways that we can uh, put this into practice this week or, or just some things to think about as you move forward. Again, I want to continue to encourage you Uh, Use this time to get caught up on rewriting Romans. Rewrite the passage this week and use your own words. Um, Think through how you can follow Jesus' example of self-sacrifice this week. I just saw a wonderful example of it uh, today. We had a couple folks from our church come out and mow the yard of the lady who lives next to us who wasn't going to be able to do that herself. And um, they fixed her lawnmower and it was just a wonderful ministry to her and to her son. Uh, things to practice. Go through this passage and list out what does it say about the character of God? Because again, I want to encourage you, keep looking for those ways where you have your vision of God expanded and deepened. And then pray. Ask the Lord to make the cross more real to you every day. 
Right now, what is very real to us are the threats related to the coronavirus. But what is the reality that is deeper and stronger and eternal is the reality of the cross. But we see the coronavirus stuff in 3D and we see the the we see the the cross sometimes just in 2D. And so I I need to go before the Lord constantly and ask him today make the cross more real to me than the coronavirus that I'm reminded of how much I can trust you. Why do we pray to that end right now and we'll wrap up. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can trust you. We look at the evidence that demonstrates that you are trustworthy, and that evidence is the cross, where your perfect justice and your perfect mercy came together out of your perfect, unfailing, unswerving love for us. Lord, may we continue to look at the cross in these times to be reminded of the God we can trust. Lord, we do ask that you would protect us from financial loss, from illness, from from the stresses that are coming from the change of routine. And Lord, we know that as you take us through this, and you will take us through this, we will come to the other side and we will declare that you were good to us all along, every step of the way. And we thank you for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and I look forward to connecting with you again soon.